George Hanks and Jim Daniels had a right to be proud. And they were. The Knights and their drag strip were things the whole city could take pride in. No wonder they came out by the hundreds or even thousands to watch every drag meet. Then Walt pointed out a man at the refreshment counter. His name was Phillips, a top designing engineer from Detroit. Did you know that a whole lot of the engine ideas in new cars were first tested and proved on drag strips and dry lakes? Things like dual exhaust, dual carburetors, and high compression heads. Phillips was there to watch for applications his company could use. You know, by the time they called my number, I'd become so interested I almost forgot what I was there for. But this was my chance to show them. I didn't have any doubt about breaking the record. The only question I had was, by how much? But either that clock was broken or somebody was being funny, I thought. They had me clocked at a little over 70, just half the speed of the top car. I complained to Walt just who the comic was. Walt said nobody, the time was right. But if I wanted to try a drag race, I sure did. Now I could really show them. Right on the drag strip with no phony clocks. Out of my way, starter. Yeah, I showed them all right. I had the coldest hot rod on the strip. I was left so far back I could have been driving Jack Benny's Maxwell. Obviously, I had a lot to learn from these squares. Well, there was still the reliability run. You'd think by now I'd have had better sense than to go through with it, but I didn't. And I learned another lesson. I couldn't even finish. My radiator boiled over and I ran out of gas. And I was gonna teach them about hot rods. When that 1925 star went by me, that did it. Right then, I made up my mind. If it was the last thing I ever did, I had to be one of the knights. So I got the list of membership requirements from Walt and his sister. She was the club secretary. And guess the first thing I had to do? I had to learn to drive. Imagine that, after all the miles I'd driven. But after a couple of sessions in the dual control car, I found out there was a whole lot more to good, safe driving than knowing how to turn the wheel or which pedal is the gas. Actually, there was more I didn't know about driving than I did know. But that was just the first requirement. Next thing on the list was to go six months without a citation or even a warning. That was really tough at first, but I made it. Believe me, I was never so glad of anything in my life as I was to get hold of that little knight's membership card. But I knew one thing. I was a whole lot better and a safer driver than I was before I started working for it. Janet asked me to come outside. She said the knights were holding a clinic and wanted me to join them. And that's when I found out how little I actually did know about souping up an engine. The Knights were holding a clinic, all right, on my car. I thought I'd revved up my motor pretty well. But now I learned about porting and relieving the block, cylinder bore, racing flywheels, custom camshafts, exhaust headers, dual exhaust, tolerances, new ignition, high compression heads, hemispherical combustion chambers, dual carbs, dual point distributors, dual intake. Well, I needed a mechanic's dictionary to even follow what they were talking about. All those parts and the tools were gonna cost money. So I got a job after school on Saturdays to pay for them. You know, some guys spend thousands of dollars on a good hot rod, plus thousands of hours of work. <laughs> they won't even drive them in traffic. Some careless driver might smash into them and ruin a car that costs more than a Cadillac.
While I was getting the money together, I read every book on mechanics I could get. I got a few ideas, too, about carburetors, mostly. I decided to rebuild my car for the reliability run instead of the drag race. This would give me a better chance to try my carburetor ideas. And you know something? My ideas paid off, too. It took me a few months, but I finally won a third place for reliability. But I got a real surprise when they started giving out the trophies. How? Well, the city merchants had awarded a trip to the Memorial Day race at Indianapolis to the boy, the club voted most deserving. And guess who the Knights elected? Me, Bill Bowers, the ex-ticket champ. How about that? Then Mr. Phillips, you know, the Detroit engineer, came over and wanted to look at my carburetor. He asked if I'd be interested in a scholarship for their factory school to study mechanical engineering. They've given a lot of scholarships to fellows in hot rod clubs, and a lot of them became top mechanics and designers. Of course, I said yes. So I got the biggest kick of my life, seeing the 500-mile race. They'd arranged for Ralph De Palma to show me around, too. He introduced me to racing stars like Manny Ayula and Ab Jenkins. And Mr. De Palma and Harry Hartz talked over old times. We looked over all the cars, too. Bob Estes and driver Don Freeland were wheeling their special out for a warm-up run. This is the toughest race of all, for cars and drivers. A speed trial and reliability run all at once. What a kick, meeting famous guys like Duke Nalen and Roger Ward. And they told me they all considered Ralph De Palma the greatest driver in Indianapolis history. And Wilbur Shaw, the president of the Indianapolis Speedway, agreed with him. He won the race three times himself. You think the races are fast, you should watch the pit crews work. Why, they can change a tire faster than a blowout can go flat. A driver just couldn't win the race without a good pit crew to work his car over during the pit stops. Then, on the morning of Memorial Day, the big race started. I think there were about 200,000 people watching. The biggest crowd for any sports event in the country. And get this, out of the 33 cars, nine of them were driven by ex-hot rodders, members of clubs like the Knights. The winner drove the 500 miles in less than four hours. That means an average of better than 125. Yeah, like I said, it was the biggest kick I ever had. Hard to realize I was actually sitting there, watching the biggest race in the world. Yeah, it's tough to believe now that that jerk in the slop-up was me, just a few months back, before I became a knight. You see, the reckless kid and an old clunker like that one is not a hot rodder at all. He's a square and a shot rod. Real hot rodders in organized clubs and timing associations all over the country have taken what used to be a hazard and turned it into a real hobby and a genuine benefit to their communities. Not just through safe driving and driver education either. They've raised thousands of dollars for charity, conducted blood drives for the Red Cross, and developed top mechanics and designers for automobile manufacturers, as well as testing and proving ideas that have produced better, safer cars for everybody. So that's the real story of the cool hot rod. The one-time hazard that has become a brand new safe, progressive American hobby.